Hello. Thank you so much. I am convinced that uh, the refreshments will not disappear during the lecture, so hopefully there will be a, an opportunity to finish uh, these beautiful snacks which uh, have left until now to finish them after the lecture. Uh, so please uh, take your seats and uh, we will slowly begin. And uh, so let me welcome you again. Uh, really uh, cordially in this uh, very nice uh, new lecture hall of the Institute of Physics. So maybe for some of you, this is the uh, first time when you are visiting the still uh, quite new building of Solid 21. So this is uh, one of the first uses uh, for the larger audience here of this, of this particular hall. So uh, I'm very glad that this is uh, for the occasion of uh, Dvořák lecture. So and uh, we have uh, used this uh, festive opportunity uh, to do one more thing at the very beginning uh, before the lecture itself. And uh, this is to hand over uh, the diplomas of uh, emeritus scientists uh, to uh, three of our uh, very esteemed colleagues, uh, all of them from Division 3, from Cukrovagnická. And uh, so this is... Uh, like a special honor for uh, selected, uh, very respected scientists uh, after their uh, long career that uh, by the president of the Czech Academy of Sciences, uh, they, are, uh, they um, have awarded this diploma of uh, emeritus uh, uh, researcher or emeritus uh, scientist of the Czech Academy of Sciences. And uh, now I have here uh, these uh, three desks with these diplomas, and uh, I will try to uh, hand this over uh, to our esteemed colleague, as I said, and uh, I will follow uh, in the alphabetical order. So I would like to call uh, Dr. Pavel Novak, uh, if he can uh, go up here. Uh, so hopefully it will be not uh, too demanding for you, because uh, we are asked to make a photograph as well. <laughs> So my congratulations, and uh, we thank you very much for all the years of your work here at the Institute of Physics. Okay. So this was the first one, uh, and then the second one is uh, Professor Ivan Pelant. So please. Uh, Dr. Novak, do not disappear us. Please wait here because we were asked to make then the group photo of four of us uh, at the very end. So, Professor Pelland, so my congratulations as well. Thank you very much for all the years of your work. Thank you. Thank you. 
And, and the, the third one uh, is uh, Dr. Antonin Šimunek. So again, my congratulations and many thanks for um, all these years of your service. So now, please, gentlemen, if you can step up uh, for... Okay, so here, there you go. So please, uh, right here. <laughs> so Mr. Photographer will organize us, so this is, it's fine, okay. okay thank you very much, and uh, I think it deserves an applause. Okay, and uh, now we are going forward uh, to the Dvořák lecture itself. And uh, so you can see the photograph of the former director of Institute of Physics, uh, Vladimir Dvořák, here in the middle, uh, below our screen. And uh, so I would like to just remind you that uh, Vladimir Dvořák was a, a very renowned solid state physicist. Uh, possibly uh, the most prominent Czech scientist in the field of theory of electricity and of uh, structural phase transitions. And his whole uh, working life was uh, affiliated with uh, our institute, with the Institute of Physics. And uh, he served as a director of the institute for eight years uh, between uh, 1993 and uh, 2001. He was also the member of Learn Society of the Czech Republic since 1995. And uh, he is also very well remembered uh, as uh, one of the main protagonists uh, of the reforms here in the Institute uh, after the Velvet Revolution, after the year uh, 1989. So, uh, for years, uh, he would be one of the most uh, cited and internationally renowned uh, scientists here at the Institute of Physics at FZU. And uh, his strong personality really influenced the, the program, scientific program and development, not only of the Department of the Electrics, but uh, even of uh, other parts of the Institute, especially uh, during the time when he was the uh, director of the Institute. So. Dr. Dvořák uh, unfortunately passed away uh, in uh, year 2007 and uh, since then uh, there, is, uh, there was started this tradition of uh, annual uh, Dvořák lectures and uh, we are now uh, having the 12th Dvořák lecture and uh, we are having this time uh, Professor Jorge Roca from the Colorado State University from United States. And uh, he was invited uh, uh, upon the invitation by uh, our Division 5, Division of uh, High Power Systems, High Power Lasers. And uh, the head of the division, uh, Dr. Tomáš Mocek, will give uh, the proper introduction uh, to Professor Roka. So Tomáš, please. So, <clears throat> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I introduce uh, today's distinguished uh, speaker, uh, I have to share with you one uh, sad news. As you know, the Institute of Physics has uh, two laser infrastructures uh, built in Dolní Břežany, uh, in uh, the region of uh, central uh, Bohemia. Uh, we would never be able to uh, build these two laser centers without the big support of the local uh, municipality. municipality. Uh, today morning, uh, I got up and I thought that I am still uh, dreaming. Unfortunately, yesterday, very suddenly, uh, the mayor of Dolní Břežany, uh, uh, Dr. Věslav Michalík, he passed away unexpectedly. And uh, I want to appreciate on behalf of both the laser centers and the Institute of Physics all the good things and all the support uh, he has done for, uh, for us because without him these two uh, laser centers would not be built so smoothly 
and uh, so on. So for that, for his legacy, uh, let me please ask you for a uh, like symbolic uh, one minute of uh, silence. So thank you very much. Uh, may his soul rest in eternal peace. So now let's go to more joyful uh, thing of today. Uh, today's uh, speaker is Professor Jorge Roca. Uh, he is from Colorado State University and he is a professor uh, at two departments, uh, at the electrical and computer engineering and also department of uh, physics. He was born in uh, Argentina and then moved to United States where he made his uh, career and then settled down. So he is a citizen of United States with his wife who is actually also physicist at Colorado State uh, University. And uh, in the early career he was, uh, he became famous for the construction and demonstration of the very first uh, capillary discharge XUV laser at 47 nanometers. That's, uh, that's the moment when we met for the first time in late 90s at some uh, X-ray laser conferences. But at the same time, he has been developing also laser sources, uh, particularly the, the, the dark pumped solid state lasers uh, and related uh, technologies. Not only that, he applied successfully these uh, intense uh, uh, X-ray and also visible laser beams to uh, applications, which actually as you will see probably, are covering very broad uh, area of physics, uh, uh, including some uh, like nanoscience and also the diagnostics of uh, hot dense uh, plasmas. Uh, Professor Roca, he received the, the two awards uh, worth to mention, the Arthur Shavlov Prize in Laser Science from APS and later on the LAMP Award for Laser Science and uh, Quantum Optics. Uh, he is a good friend of mine and we have many common stories and relationships and I am so glad that not only me but many other researchers from the section 5 and now also section 9, namely Bedrick Rus, we have uh, like uh, common activities and know each other. So it's honor to have you here Jorge and uh, his talk today is uh, of course we section five, we do high power lasers. Therefore, the talk today is high power lasers from intense X-ray beams to relativistic nanophotonics. Jorge, the stage is yours. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I am certainly very thankful to uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Thomas Mosek, and also thankful to uh, the director, uh, Michael Rosek, for the opportunity to give this uh, uh, Borjak lecture. Uh, I have seen the very diverse list of speakers, right, doing this lecture. It's truly an honor to be here. And it's also a pleasure because, as um, basically was already mentioned, right, uh, I think I have a close relation with, uh, you know, uh, several of your groups, right? and uh, some long uh, collaborations, like, like with uh, Libor Huha, he's here, right? We have been collaborating for I don't know how long, 15, 20 years. We have a laser that we built that he um, basically had very, you know, efficiently using to do a broad spectrum of, uh, you know, um, uh, investigations, right? And also, I know I have known people that, uh, you know, uh, Eli, and high lays right for 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 decades, and I have seen with pleasure really how uh, these institutes have blossomed. Right, you know I think the uh, first time I was here in Prague, this institute did not exist. Right, I came to the you know your old building right and saw the labs, and then you know m and my next visit I saw all these modern buildings with uh, you know um, amazing facilities at at the world scale, right and how these groups uh, right, have been uh, you know, um, uh, put together. We had the pleasure on our lab to receive uh, visitors from, from here. I think it's um, 
<laughs> some of them for, you know, uh, Jaroslav Nietzsche spent more than a year, right? Um, and uh, basically, even we have visitors from your group, so I think, you know, we have, uh, you know, close collaboration, so it's a real pleasure to, to be here. So thank you very much for the, for the invitation. So um, as Thomas mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, high power lasers, right? And basically cover a little bit about how some of these lasers are used to produce radiation at very short wavelengths, right? That is on the extreme ultraviolet soft X-rays. And then I'm going to talk about some examples of how ultra intense lasers um, are made to interact with, with, the, with materials, right? So uh, I know this is a very diverse audience, right? So um, I try to make some, uh, you know, in introductory statements, right? Uh, and the power and intensity of today's most powerful laser is, is just, right, um, amazing. And they can create extreme temperatures, pressures, um, electric fields, Right, that are only encountered basically on the center of stars or on the frontier of black holes. And today in 2022, high power lasers have reached power of 10 petawatts. There is more than one pe 10 petawatt laser now in the world. And that's 10 to the 16 watts, right? And of course, you know, it's hard to grasp what that means, right? It's just a gigantic number. But I thought maybe this way about putting it is is a hundred trillion, a hundred watt light bulbs, okay? And that's a number that's also hard to understand for the mind. But if one imagines that each light bulb, you know, has a certain diameter, and you put them almost touching, let's say 10 centimeters apart, right? You could put light bulbs from the Earth to Pluto, right? To have the number of light bulbs necessary to generate that amount of power, right? So it's a you know, amount of power that was inconceivable right, um, you know, in, in not, not long ago. And today, the uh, intensity of these lasers um, surpassed 10 to 23 watts per square centimeter, right? And the associated electric field, right, with those basically laser pulses is um, more than 100,000 times stronger than the electric field that bounds an electron, right, into intrahydrogen atom. The pressure that they can generate right, is terabarts, right, for comparison, right, the pressure on the center of the sun is 0 0.24 terabarts, right, so these lasers are tools that open, right, new frontiers, right, on, uh, um, on, um, uh, on physics. Now, how can these high intensities be created, right, such enormous intensities? Well, for that one needs to go back, you know, a little bit to the history of the laser, Right, and I understand not all of you are, you know, um, laser specialists. And the amplification of light, right, is on the world we live in, not a natural thing, right? You have, for example, here a person, right, working, um, you know, walking on the street, right? And actually, all materials surrounding this person really absorb light, right? Her sunglasses, right, the tilted windows of the cars going by, you know, some of the windows of the building. You know, the light that impinges on any of these materials, right, is attenuated, right? It's not amplified, right? And there is, let's say, no materials beaming at her, right? And the reason is that basically in the, our normal environment, right, on thermal equilibrium, the atoms, right, and molecules that constitute the material, they, their populations are on the lower levels. So if one has radiation impinging on them, right, the light basically gets absorbed, promoting right, the atoms to a higher level, right, and the photon being up is being absorbed, right? So that's what dominates, right, under the thermal um, equilibrium conditions we basically live in. So somehow one has to break that equilibrium, right, to create just the opposite. L that light, when it goes through a material, will get amplified, right? And the understanding on basically how, um, okay, yeah, I wanted to say that once the atoms get excited, right, they live there for a short time. That was the last animation. And they will spontaneously emit, right, light, like this, you know, um, say, in fluorescent lamp, right? And photons will come out in any direction, and that's, you know, what's known as spontaneous emission. But going back on how you amplify the light, 
right? Um, Einstein realized, right, it basically it's more than a century ago, that another phenomena besides absorption and um, spontaneous emission can take place, and it takes place, and it's what's called stimulated emission. That is, if after one promoted the atoms to an upper state using some means like absorption, for example, that we just mentioned, or basically exciting the atoms by, by electron impact excitation, if one excite atoms, before they have time to get the excited by spontaneous emission, if radiation such it, with photons corresponding to the same energy than the energy gap uh, between these two levels uh, interact with the atoms, they can induce the atoms to get de-excited and emit radiation, right? And that's called stimulated right, emission of radiation, right? Einstein was not trying to invent a laser. Right, but it was obvious with his description that there was a, reci there was a recipe for the amplification of, um, of light, right? And lasers, right, um, started basically, um, um, I mean, today laser is a word, right? You can go to dictionaries, this laser describes the device, right? But actually, um, it started basically um, being light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, right? And then we see two cases, right, A in which light interacts with matter. That is, light can interact with basically matter in which most atoms are on the lower energy state, and that will absorb light, or can interact with a material in which by um, some method of pumping the atoms to a higher level, a stimulated emission can dominate, and then you can amplify light, right? So basically, the one can derive from there the condition on when light will be absorbed, when it will be amplified, right? And as stated there, there is we have more atoms on an, a lower level than an upper level. The material will absorb, and the, ab the absorption of the light will be exponential, right? And on the opposite case, in when there is more atoms on the upper than on the lower level, we have then exponential, right, um, basically amplification. And it took s basically, you know, more than 50 years, right, to people to take, um, you know, the concept of um, stimulated emission of radiation and discovered by Einstein and implement it into a device that really do the job, right? And there were a few cases to people that got very close, right? Like, for example, Fabricant, right? There were experiments that got very close to making a laser like, for example, in the 1930s, right? But it was not until 1960, right, that the ruby laser was, um, was in, um, basically um, invented, right, by um, um, Theodore Maiman, who at the time was at the Hughes Research Lab in, um, in California, basically following ideas, right, uh, already published on, um, uh, that suggested how to, you know, that might be done, and uh, the Nobel Prize for the invention of the laser went in 1964 to Charles Town, uh, Nikolai Basov, and Alexander Prohorov, right? And what Maiman did is, well, to promote the atoms, I mean, he used ruby as the laser material, and the active atom there is chromium, right? And ruby is um, um, sapphire dope with chromium. So he used a simple flash lamp such that the light would be absorbed by the chromium atoms on the ground state and be promoted to a level that rapidly decay and populate, which is the upper level of the laser transition, right? Calling this condition that we just discussed in which the number of atoms on the upper level is larger than the atoms on the lower level, which people call a population inversion, right? And one might say, well, inversion respect to what? Well, to the normal state of things. Normal state of things in thermal equilibrium is that you have more atoms on the lower level than an upper level, right? And you have to invert that situation. So for the pump, he used a flash lamp, just discharge a capacitor through a regular, right, xenon flash lamp. Some of the light went into the ruby rod. The atoms absorb the light, get create a population inversion, and then a amplification. And he got lacing at 694 um, nanometers, right? And the picture on the right actually is a picture of Arthur Shallow, 
who also was a contributor to some of the ideas, right, that um, created the laser. In fact, he was a brother-in-law of um, Charles Towns. Uh, you know, he marries Charles Towns, uh, basically, uh, sister. Uh, so they were collaborating at the time. He did not get the Nobel Prize. So only three people can get the Nobel Prize. But he got the Nobel Prize for laser spectroscopy, right, a few years, um, a few years later. Right, he was a major contributor to the development of the laser. And he was, you know, a, of course, very smart, a, you know, a guy who liked to make jokes, right? So one thing he, the laser was invented, you know, the, um, um, his group built a, you know, a very simple, you know, low power ruby laser. And some trick he, he, he liked to play in lectures is to explode a darker balloon inside a clear balloon, right? And so the light would not be absorbed on the other balloon, would be absorbed on the you know, darker balloon inside, and the balloon would pop, right? And then something he'd say is, well, the lasers are going to be good, for example, to make a laser eraser, right? So you have basically just a page you print, right, and you ablate it with a laser, right? But people were really thinking, what can we use this thing? And for, at the beginning, it was no more than, than a, you know, than a toy. Or, as had been said, was a solution finding you know, finding a problem. Of course, that rapidly changed, as you all know, right? Now we are in an age that m uh, most, most of you own a laser, right? Have a laser pointer, or, you know, so most people in the world uh, they own a laser, you know, nowadays. And as you know, they are using um, welding, surgery, remote sensing, uh, ranging, um, of course, imaging, um, making holograms, optical communications, right? Right, we pick up the phone, and most likely, you know, um, our phone call is going to go in part through, you know, um, optical fibers in which the source of the light are, you know, laser, laser pulses, right? And even a field that right now is have a large rebirth, which is basically laser-driven fusion, right? That if achieved, of course, um, promises right clean energy, basically, when at almost uh, an exhaustible fuel, which is, which is um, um, water. And at the beginning, it was thought that the ruby was a very special material, and there were going to be only a few materials where you could amplify light. And turned out to be that's almost the opposite, right? It's almost hard to find a material you're going to make it lace if you don't do the right thing. And then um, Arthur Shallow uh, had another, basically, demonstrative joke. He would like to leave lectures at the beginning of the laser, and he would bring um, gelatin, right? And then he would um, excite it. At the time, there were other lasers. There were nitrogen lasers. He would excite it with nitrogen laser and make a laser out of gelatin. And then he would eat the gelatin and said that this is an eatable laser, basically, right? And it's a joke, but it's a point, okay? The, the point is that if you do the right things to a material, you will cause a population inversion, and you will cause, you'll make a, you know, a laser. So if right now you go to the periodic table and see which are the elements that have made lace, right? Basically, you can basically populate the majority of the elements on the periodic table. And, in fact, the world's largest laser, that's the National Ignition Facility in the Lawrence Livermore Lab in California, is a four megajoule laser, right? It's larger than a soccer field. It's made out of glass, right? And glass, right, is a material that, you know, humanity have known for millenniums, right? In fact, you know, this might be the most beautiful line of my talk, right, on the, the one on the left, because that, those are, it's a picture of one of the vitros in the Chartres Cathedral, right? These are 800 years old vitros, and you can see how people knew very well how dope different glasses, okay, to um, obtain basically these um, different colors, you know, that they wanted. Well, glass, right, is the laser um, used at NIF. NIF is a powerful laser, right? And um, many of these um, um, powerful lasers, right, or high, the high energy lasers, are made um, always in the same way. You start with a low power laser that produces a light seed, right? And then you go through an amplifier that amplifies the light. And because the light immediately gets to be, with this exponential amplification, right, that we were talking, right, light immediately amplifies to intensities that can start damaging the material, right? Like, for example, take, let's say, take a typical laser material. The gain is one centimeter to the minus one, meaning if you go through one centimeter of material, light gets amplified 
e to the 1. Well, not very impressive, right? But now you make the laser rod 10 centimeters in length, right? And you have amplification of e to the 10th already, right? So you start destroying materials. So the trick used for many years, right, was what you do is, well, you expand the beam in the area to decrease the intensity. You go through a larger amplifier, and then you repeat the trick, right? Basically, you, um, yeah, let me see. There's the laser pointer here. Oh, it's this one. So basically, you um, expand the beam again, right, and go through the next, um, you know, the next amplifier, right? So, so the uh, amplifiers, these layers, they have very large aperture, right? But people know how to make very large glass, right? So it's not, you know, not a problem. But at one point, right, you're just limited by space, you know, and, uh, and so on. So there was basically between, um, basically it was 15 to 20 years in which after the invention of the laser and a few techniques were developed that produced a rapid increase on laser power and intensity, there was like 15 and 20 years that there was a plateau, not much progress. And the reason is that people already use this trick of expanding the beam, right, to large size, but, you know, it was starting to become impractical. And that's when idea came in, right, that was the subject of the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics that went to Donna Strickland and Gerard Moreau, which the idea is, well, if the high intensity is damaging the material, let's reduce the intensity let's amp and, and, and then amplify. So the idea is you have a pulse, right? And then you stretch it in time, producing a, a, a chirp in frequency. So you decrease the intensity, right? The energy is the area under the curve. So basically, you almost maintain the same energy, just lose a little bit. But now you have much less intensity. And on this cartoon, this is stretched by factor three. But in practice, one stretches thousands of times, like for example, 10,000 times. Right? So the intensity comes down 10,000 times. So now one can amplify without damaging the material. Right? And then at the end, one compresses the pulse to obtain the original pulse width. The pulse stretching and the pulse compression is done with diffraction gratings. Okay? And the person that invented how to compress pulses with gratings is Tracy. Okay, and the first demonstration of chirp pulse amplification, right, which is this technique, uh, was the 2018 Nobel Prize, use not gratings by an optical fiber, basically dispersion on optical fiber to stretch the pulse, but that stretcher did not match the compressor very well. Okay, and then it's with great pressure to tell you that one of my closest friends, also from Argentina, okay, doing his undergraduate project in the same lab and living in the same building than me, Okay, uh, my close friend of Carl Martinez came with a breakthrough idea of just using the gratings also to stretch, right? And basically, um, these people are cited, right? They didn't make the novel, right? But, but they were major contributors to CPA as, 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 as is known now. So this is the technique that's behind the, right, the highest intensity lasers, right? Of which you have... Um, um, several of them here in Prague, right? You have some of the most intense lasers in the world at um, Eli, right? And at, at, uh, and at uh, um, uh, high laser. They use basically this idea, which is a stress, a stretch, amplify, and, and, and uh, compress. And, and this is a slide, right? This is a map of um, the, um, this uh, association of ultra-intense lasers, right? That publishes a map of ultra-intense lasers in, uh, in the world. And these are the laser of more than 100 terawatts. And I think this is already two or three years old. And basically, it's running out of room, OK, where to put lasers more than 100 terawatts. And if you notice, OK, if you look uh, you know, here, right, you have uh, you know, Eli, Paz, you know, high laser, right? So several of them right, are situated here. And one is in our lab, right? And there's many more through the world. So I think. Uh, IQL will have to redefine, right, what's the threshold, because, the, you know, there's just, this in, 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 in f just, just few more years, there's going to be just too many, so they will need to raise the level, say, maybe laser more than one petawatt, right? And again, it will shrink like how this diagram was maybe, you know, five years ago or, 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 or something like that. So another frontier of lasers, right, short wavelengths, right? When the laser was invented, there are always, uh, there were frontiers on trying to increase the power, increase intensity, and another frontier uh, 
um, is uh, obtain shorter wavelengths, right? And just the motivation for doing that is that just as there are many applications on the visible region of the spectrum that we spoke about, and there is actually too many to put on this on this uh, view graph, there are many reasons to try to produce um, coherent radiation, laser radiation, at a, a much shorter wavelength, let's say on the stream ultraviolet soft, you know, soft X-rays. And that's to do high resolution microscopy, to do um, basically to create nanoprobes, to do nanomachining, right? This visible laser have been doing micromachining for decades, right? But shorter wavelengths can take the machining to the nanoscale. And a variety of um, you know, probes and of course fundamental physics on studied light in the interaction of light with, um, you know, with atoms. And that motivated the international community to build large user facilities, right? The so-called free electron lasers, right? To produce beams of light right, on the extreme ultraviolet and soft X-rays, and now, now X-rays, right? And here, basically, you um, don't um, interact with atoms, rather you create an electron beam and make the beam basically uh, undulate or oscillate into an uh, alternative magnetic field, right? And on the process of um, doing this, the electrons bunch and will start emit, emit coherently, Right, and what comes out are basically short pulses of um, radiation. Right, these are large facilities in which you're going to do an experiment. Right, you have to take your experiment to the facilities. Um, what um, and they they have tremendous intensity, right, and do, can do very unique physics. But there is also a need, an opportunity, basically, to develop mic more compact sources. Right that you can ha have on a tabletop or maybe even on top of a desk, right? And, and this is the laser that the Libor has in his lab, right? It's, you know, we call it desktop because it would fit here, okay? It would fit on top of this, uh, uh, on this podium. It's the size of, you know, let's say, of a um, computer. Um, this laser uh, emits light at uh, 46.9 nanometers, right? Pulses uh, of a fraction of a millijoule, and then you can pump lasers with visible laser. We'll talk a little bit more on that. And these are th things, right, that we have done uh, in our lab, basically using this laser. We have done um, nanomachining. Uh, we have done a microscopy with high resolution. We have used it as a probe of dense plasmas. When the plasma is very dense, right, right light gets refracted on the uh, density gradients in the plasma, so you cannot penetrate the plasma. But as you go to shorter wavelengths, right, that happens in a much reduced manner, and you can probe, you know, you can probe a plasma, so you can do plasma diagnostics. You can implement techniques as interferometry, right? Uh, you can do um, um, chemistry, right? Uh, Nanopatterning, right? And, uh, and so on. So for that, okay, so this, these are plasma-based, basically um, atomic lasers. They're very analog analogous, let's say, to the um, Ruby laser that we you know, just um, discussed, with the difference is that the energy separation right, in um, the levels of Ruby is such that what one gets out is basically deep red light. If one wants to get, let's say, soft X-rays out, right, these levels need to be much more separated. Right? But the atom that has the highest ionization potential is helium, and that's 26 you know, 24.6 electron volts, right? So if you want to go to much shorter wavelength, you need to use multiple uh, highly ionized ions. So the job is first to create the laser material, right, which is a plasma, and you do that, you know, um, irradiating, right, um, um, typically solid, can also be a gas, right? And then your pumping, right, is done either by an electrical discharge, we have done that on our lab, or by um, absorption of a, an intense laser. And on this example, for example, cadmium is ionized 20 times, right? 20 electrons are kicked off from cadmium atom. And there you can produce a population inversion between two levels that will produce lacing at 132 Armstrongs. Let's say 50 times shorter time, right, than a, a wavelength than the than the um, uh, ruby laser. For that, you need to create a fairly hot plasma, right? 100 to 1,000 electron volts, and needs to be 
you know, a dense plasma. So people realize this, right? In, in a, you know, particular, you know, in, in theoreticians, right? From, uh, you know, um, particularly from Russia, right? They were leading in the concept of plasma-based, right? The soft X-ray lasers. But everyone understood that you needed a very powerful source to create such high degree of ionization. So the first time this was um, successfully done on the lab, basically what was the world largest laser at the time, right? It was the Novet and then the Nova laser at Lawrence Livermore lab, used to be the world largest laser in, in around 1985, right? Um, um, scientists at Livermore basically used two beams of um, um, this laser to focus it on a selenium foil, right? To ionize uh, selenium to high degree of ionization, produce a population inversion, and produce lacing in lines above 20 nanometers, right? 21 nanometers. Simultaneously, there was an experiment at Princeton, actually using carbon and a different um, atomic um, mechanism to uh, produce gain at 18.2 um, nanometers. So when you know, I started to work at Colorado State University, I didn't have a very large budget. So I could not buy an intense laser to make an extra laser, but soft extra laser, but I wanted to make soft extra laser, right? Uh, but I knew that, you know, a um, kilojoule laser, it's a very expensive laser, but a kilojoule capacitor, right, of, uh, you know, um, a size smaller than, you know, the size of the screen of this computer, right, cross sections smaller than that, right, is fairly cheap and also contains a kilojoule. So if you can figure out how to dump electrical energy into the material, right, to do the right thing, you will achieve these high degrees of ionization which are necessary to cut a population inversion and gain, right, um, in the media. And we decided to go um, um, and uh, make a laser on argon gas. And for that, basically, we took another cheap element, right, the ceramic tube, right? Um, in fact, we bought it from a beer factory close by, Core Ceramic, right, in Colorado, right? And put an electrode at each end, right? And discharged this, uh, the capacitor through the channel, right? to highly ionize the column, such that when current starts flowing, right, you generate, the current generates a magnetic field, and then you have a, basically, J cross V force, right, Lorentz force, that compresses the plasma, right, towards the center. So the plasma uniformly pinches towards the center, and you end up dumping most of the energy, or a large fraction of the energy of the capacitor, right, now into a, two to three hundred micron column, right, that is as long as the capillary. Okay, work went in to make the column stable, right, because people know that these type of pinches are not very stable, but basically we use a few tricks to, like, pre-ionizing the, the, um, the media, that is, f we didn't immediately discharge the capacitor, we put a low current um, through the, um, through the uh, channel to create a plasma prior to heating it up with a, you know, with a, a high current pulse. And these are interferograms, there's real data showing the um, column compressing. This happens in about, you know, 20 nanoseconds or, or, um, or, um, or so. And then at that point, right, the uh, argon gets uh, ionized eight times. Argon has 18 electrons, yes, you remember, right? So if you take eight electrons away, the electronic structure is that of neon. Right, so people call eight times ionized argon neon-like argon. So we produce population inversion on this transition here on a neon-like argon, that's argon plus eight. And when we made the column three centimeters in length and look from the end with a spectrometer, that's what we saw. Okay, it looks like a lamp, right, not like a laser. There's many lines coming off from different ions and so on, but that's the one that the model said should have gained. But then if you make the column six centimeters in length, this is how the spectrum starts looking like. See, this line has gain. Basically, it's, it's significantly larger than those. And now if you only make the column twice as long, right? And that's what the power of the exponential amplification, right? This, this line, basically, which has gain, right, grows. This, this scale says 100 here. That scale says, right, two here, right? So it's almost towards a magnitude, right, amplification. The other lines are still here. 
right? But the land, the, the, the gain on this line, right, is so large that basically that's the only thing that you see on the spectrum. You make the column even longer, you continue having this growth for tens of thousands of times, right? Until finally, the growth of the um, um, laser basically intensity saturates. And one says, oh, such a pity, where I was having so much gain just making the column a little bit longer, and now the game is over. But actually, it's good news, right? Because when you saturate, means you are extracting all the energy or the majority of the energy that you invest, uh, you um, uh, store on the population inversion. So any efficient, high-power laser wants to work on this regime, on the saturated regime. That's true for the lasers we spoke before, the visible laser, right, and so on. You want to operate the amplifiers under um, basically gain saturation. The other thing that improves with the um, plasma column length in this case is the coherence. When the capillary is short, right, coherence is the ability of light to interfere, right. So you want to create an interferogram, right, you need to, c to have coherent light. If the column is long, is short, then if you try to make the light interfere, right, well, there's no much interference. This is a poor spatial coherence. But as the column is, this short column is made longer, it acts like a plasma acts like a filter, and the beam becomes more and more coherent. So in this case, for a 36 centimeter column, right, uh, basically the majority of light, you know, is um, uh, emanating, right, is, um, you know, is, um, um, is coherent. So again, this is the size of the device, right, this, you know, um, very compact, right, and here you see the current pulse in blue, right, and when the column pinches here, right, this, that's when the laser spike, right, um, basically comes out. And using basically this laser, um, we and others, like here in Prague, right, uh, basically ha have used it for many applications. And on this case, basically, this is a microscope, right, in which the um, laser light is focused by uh, reflecting mirrors at the, at the right wavelength, right? Uh, these are multi-layer mirrors that il illuminating an object, which in this case is the tip of a magnetic um, force microscope, right? And then a Fresnel lens images on a detector. In this case, it was a CCD detector. And the experiments we did, in a single shot, okay, we could image this tip with high resolution. Here's, for example, a single shot image of carbon nanowires, which are 50 nanometers in diameter, right? Uh, illuminated by single shot of the laser. So you can perfectly resolve 50 nanometer diameter wires. That is because in a microscope, the resolution is directly proportional to the wavelength of the illumination, right? So if you have, let's say, 10 times shorter wavelength, you have 10 times more resolution. But because the pulse is short, relatively short, it's a nanosecond, you could also image dynamic phenomena. So we made this probe oscillate at 319 um, uh, kilohertz using piezoelectric. And let me see if the movie plays, right? And then, yeah, and then, and then basically we made this movie, right, of the probe uh, oscillating, uh, basically with an amplitude of plus minus uh, 200 nanometers, basically, right? And you see the probe, basically. So this is a nano movie, basically, taking with, the, with EV light. Um, so uh, our colleague Mario Marconi used the coherence of this laser to do holography, right? And so he had a nanowires, 200 nanometers in diameter, nanopillars, right? That also he vibrate with the piece electric, and he did holograms, right, of the pillars, basically, and you can see them oscillating. In this case, at half a half a megahertz. So you can do nanoscale imaging, right, with high time resolution with a desktop device, okay, very, very compact. Um, then this another applic application, and this is work of um, led by um, 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 you know my wife and colleague uh, uh, Carmen Menoni, right, uh, and which uh, you know our most recent visitor from Prague, right, Ludek uh, used in the last six months in visiting our lab. The idea here is you don't use the laser to illuminate. This is again imaging, okay? But it's, com it's not only a morphological, but it's also composition imaging. And the idea here is the following. You take the, the um, suffix ray laser, and you focus it, again, with um, um, diffractive optics into an object. For example, it can be a bi biological substance. 
and you can focus to a, to a sub-100 nanometer spot. And then you produce ablation from that sub-100 uh, nanometer spot. And of course, the photon energy that ablates the material is sufficient to photoionize the atoms and make ions. So if you put a potential that accelerates the ions and send it to a time of flight mass spectrometer, you can make basically single shot spectra right, of the material coming out from this sub-100 nanometer hole. Right? And I guess I didn't add spectra on this slide. But you get spectra, you can identify what was the material, right? what are the elements that are on that particular location. Right? And then you can move the sample right, and do the same thing and so on. So you can do it to the imaging of your subject. So in this case, for example, this is um, actually um, you know, a sample in a, with a metal is surrounded by photoresist. And you have a lateral resolution on the imaging of around 100 nanometers. If you shoot on the same place, now you can uh, determine con uh, composition in depth. And in depth, on that experiment, we had a 20 nanometer resolution. Right? So now you can do composition imaging. And you can say, well, what do you want that for? You know, um, actually, this started on a Carmen, on a, in a grant that um, Carmen Minoni got to work with our infec infectious diseases program at CSU. They are big on tuberculosis. And they really like to have the molecular composition of a tuberculosis bacillus, which is like five microns um, in size, right? That's how the project started. But other people got interested. For example, Pacific Northwest Laboratory in the US does nuclear forensic. And they would like to have the ability of determining what is the isotopic composition of uranium dust that can be only, let's say, um, one micron or just a few micron in size, right? So this laser then was used to ablate this um, basically micrometer size uh, uranium dust and determine, okay, um, basically what is the amount of uh, uranium 238 and uh, you know two, um, 235, right, with special resolution on the um, on the dust dust particle, right? Again, our colleague Mario Marconi used the fact that these lasers are coherent to do nanoscale printing. And he used the Talbot effect by which if you illuminate with coherent light a mask with a repetitive object, right, then there are planes in which basically the um, mass pattern will get reproduced. These are called the Talbot planes. So if you put a detector there or photoresist, you will imprint right, your mask, right? And the nice thing about this technique is if your mask has a diff, every, every element on the matrix of the mask contributes to print any ele um, uh, each element on the image. So that means that if you have a defect on the mask, right, and this is just one element, maybe out of 10,000, the basically defect will not print. So that's basically defect-free printing, right, using coherent um, short wavelength light. As I just mentioned, since we are also plasma people, right, like to find ways to probe plasmas, right, we use these lasers to probe um, high density laser created plasma. So we build interferometers um, that uh, work at this wavelength and at shorter wavelength with other lasers that we developed that I will mention in a moment, right, and took basically single shot um, inter interferograms, right, on a laser created plasma. With in this case, with the with a about a nanosecond resolution, from where you can reconstruct what is the plasma density right on that plasma, and you could not do this with a visible laser because as soon as the the or, an, or UV laser because as soon as they would enter the plasma, they would be deflected out, right? But the UV light can penetrate the plasma and give you and give you an image. And there are other applications, right? Colleague in chemistry, Elliot Bernstein use this source to do single photoionization of nanoclusters and molecules and publish I don't know, 20 papers basically about um, the structure and reactivity of uh, nanoclusters um, using these lasers at the phot uh, photoionization laser. Okay, but that's at 46.9, right? And that can be done with a very simple discharge. But how about going to much shorter wavelengths? Either ionizing other atoms such that they are neon-like, like we did with argon, or ionizing other nat atoms until they have 28 electrons left, which is the electronic 
structured nickel, and that also works very well. For example, how about now if we want to go to a laser that has less than 100 amstrings? Well, the, an the answer again is you need to go to levels that are more and more separated, right, and do the same thing. And for that, that means you need to go to more and more highly charged ions. For example, if you want to go make an 88 Armstrong laser, you could try to produce a population inversion in lanthanum. Of course, then the levels are separated by a large amount of energy, so you need to create a, a hot, dense plasma so the electrons will have enough energy right, to ex produce, produce a population inversion by collision or electron impact excitation. Right? So you need a hot plasma. But, again, going back to the subject of this, of high intensity lasers, right? Uh, the community at large made great progress in making very compact high-intensity lasers, right? So, let's say multi-terawatt lasers, right? Uh, you know, I show you the map of lasers more than 100 terawatts. I think a map of lasers of more than, you know, several terawatts would be just probably like a complete black figure, right? Because there would be probably tens of thousands, right, on the world. You take, let's say, one joule, uh, one joule laser, right, um, of... Um, um, create positive peak of second duration. And in this case, you bombard the target. In this case, it was silver, right? And actually, you don't come with a pulse. You come with two. One pulse creates the plasma. The other one heats it up in, you know, in a transient mode to, create, to have higher gain, right? And every time you make a shot, we rotate this target. This target you know, is like a serpentine, so it has you know, long length. You can make, you know, shoot for you know, an hour or so at 10 hertz, for example. So so th this setup creates a laser-created plasma, right, in which you can create population invert inversion in highly charged ions, so for example, 5 or 10 hertz repetition rate, right, and get, for example, lacing at significantly shorter wavelengths, right, and you can go through the periodic table, and uh, you can see here um, different elements in the wavelength at which they emit, for example, right, the palladium laser at 147 astronauts, silver, at 139 Armstrong, cadmium at 132, and so on. And then with this one joule, we are running out of energy, basically, to make lasers shorter than about 114 Armstrong, right? And, and here in tellurium, just basically saw a little bit of gain. But produce 10, 10, 10 uh, microjoules, okay, enough to do single, uh, for example, single uh, shot imaging or to do uh, interferometry, right? of plasma, with this type of lasers, and in fact with, uh, you know, uh, our old friend uh, Jim Dunn, we did experiments in Colorado and at Livermore, with diagnosing laser-created plasmas, yeah, with soft X-ray lasers. Um, then another example of an application, right, of a 13.2 nanometer uh, nickel-like cadmium laser, cadmium laser, right, um, that we did in our lab is image the lithographic mask used for lithography. People in lithography are interested in how rough the edge of features on a mask is. They have this parameter they call line edge roughness, right? And this could be measured, right, with an um, imaging system that uh, mimics the geometry of the system they used to print with such a mask, right, using what's called EUV lithography, which is the technique by which, you know, the finest um, features on microchips, right, are being printed, um, you know, uh, today. The, again, we use diffractive optics for that um, as, um, um, as lenses, and the optics were developed by collaborators at uh, CXRO at, um, um, at Berkeley. Um, okay, these lasers, though, have good spatial coherence, or can have good spatial coherence, use the right thing, but they are not temporal coherence. So, you know, you're basically the wave coming out of your amplifier looks like this, right? It's a mass. And it is because it originates from a spontaneous emission, which is this spontaneous decay, right, from atoms which have been excited to an excited level, right? So they, they just basically decay spontaneously at any moment, right? They're not on phase. And then basically you have this what's called temporal incoherent light. But the way to solve this is to create a coherent seed pulse, right, that you inject right, into the amplifier, right, until you create an, a, a coherent beam, right. The first time this was done um, on a soft X-ray laser plasma was done in France, actually by Philippe Saitun and colleagues, and then we did the same thing, right, um, in, a, in, a, in a, 
laser, sulfur laser in which the medium was a gas, right? So shortly after that, we use it on the medium created by ablating a solid, right? That allows to create sulfur lasers at many, many wells, as I show. So we created the seed by creating the high harmonics of an intense laser on a gas jet. And then we injected the high harmonic that is highly coherent, but not very, um, not very intense, right, into a um, suffix laser plasma amplifier, and then basically we obtained a full spatial and temporal coherence and got a little bit shorter pulse that we would not be seeding. This is a one picosecond, one picosecond laser. The other thing that seeding buys you is that the divergence is reduced, and so the beam is very, very nicely collimated, in this case less than one nilo radian. And, but how about going to even shorter wavelengths, let's say, right? For example, 60 Amsterdam. Well, you, need, you can keep doing the same business, right? And going to more highly ionized elements. And for that, you need lasers that are more intense. But nowadays, you know, we have and you have, right, lasers that are, you know, in, in very powerful, very intense. So using pulses from a s several joules, from a high intensity laser, which is a chirp pulse amplification laser, right? Uh, the technique I used before, right? To excite a line focus onto a, a, onto a target, right? We could make, for, we could make, for example, a laser at 7.36 nanometer in 34 times a ionized Sumerian. And you can do the same thing, right? With, um, with different um, elements like you know, you go to Gadolini, you have lasing at 69 Armstrong. You go to Terbium, you can make lasers at 66 Armstrong, 61 Armstrong. And again, here we started to run out of energy when we got to 50 Armstrong, right? And many of these results were um, basically um, um, obtained by David Alessi, that was a PhD student in our group. He is now the head of the ARC laser, the, the ultra short pulse arm of the, uh, the National Emission uh, Facility. Um, Okay, these lasers, though, work at the rep rate at which the pump laser work at, which is typically 10 hertz. How about if you want to make an extra laser at 100 hertz or maybe a kilohertz? Well, then you need a higher rep rate pump laser, right? So that was a motivation in our lab to develop um, intense, um, basically high energy, say joule level, picosecond laser that could operate, let's say, 100 hertz or a kilohertz. And the way to do that, and again, here in Prague, you have some beautiful lasers, which are very similar to this. Uh, you start basically with a dial laser, just like the one that powers this laser pointer, right? Uh, there is a semiconductor um, PN junction here you know, that is meeting the laser light of this laser pointer. Well, in this case, there is a stack of bars, each one containing many of this um, semiconductor laser. So this is a stack of dials that produces not a milliwatt or two like this, you know, pointer, but produces, for example, six kilowatts. So you take that light, you illuminate the proper laser material, right? And then you can create a beautiful laser beam that then you can go and create the line focus plasma to create the laser. And the material we use and uh, it's been used in many labs nowadays, is basically neodymium, um, a yak um, doped with, um, with deuterium, sorry. And so you pump with semiconductor laser, you can get a one micro laser out, which is, you know, very powerful. And um, this is, for example, a picture of a one kilohertz, one joule picosecond laser we have developed. He has been frequency double, that's why you, you know, for another application, that's why you see green light. But this laser can work, you know, at high rep rate. So already a few years back, actually when we had this laser working at 100 hertz, we did the same thing that I was describing, create a line focus on the material, in this case a molybdenum disc, right? Create a line focus such that spontaneous emission from one side will amplify exponentially across the plasma, right, until you get um, reach the desired gain saturation. And so this uh, molybdenum laser at 189 Armstrong, and here you have data of the laser operating at 100 hertz for half an hour, right? That's why this target is a disk, right? So you can just renew the target as you, you know, uh, ablate it, and half an hour gives you time to do some, you know, some, uh, some measurement. 
And uh, then we went and did a demonstration of 400 hertz. And what you see here is data, right, of the suffix relay laser pulses at uh, 400 hertz. And you can see that's going up first, and that's because there is some thermal lensing on the pump laser, and then it stabilizes and remains there. So those were 400 shots, suffix relay laser shots, right, in one second. Right, so this shows that then on this um, uh, suffix ray lasers, there have been great progress on repetition rate. The first suffix ray lasers produce basically a few shots per day at most. That's how f you know, rapidly this very high energy laser could fire right up to uh, today, in which these lasers can work at uh, you know, 400 hertz right, for, you know, for, uh, for applications. Okay, so entering the last part of the talk, Okay, I will go back now to talk about, again, high-power, high-intensity lasers, right? <coughs> uh, and some of the things that can be done with them. So we built one of our lasers um, at Colorado State University. Here's a, you know, a, a picture. Basically, 0 0.8 um, petawatts at 3.3 hertz um, repetition rate. And uh, just for fun, here is a picture of the pump laser right, which are glass slabs. This is a unimium glass laser. We use the slabs instead of a rod to be able to cool it and be operated at a higher rep rate. And here there is a, you know, a little movie, see if it plays, of the pump laser um, working at 3.3 uh, hertz. Oh, there's no sound. So, okay. It's a lot more spectacular with the sound. But, uh, but anyway. So, what we do is direct um, the output of that um, um, almost petawatt laser into an interaction chamber where we can focus the beam into a very tiny spot around you know, one and a half microns in diameter, achieving intensities basically uh, about 5, 10 to 21 watts per, uh, you know, per square centimeter, and um, do different experiments. And one can aim to create very extreme conditions. And I will show you an example about extreme conditions that one can create. Okay, and I was telling you, if one, for example, would like to uh, mimic the pressures on the center of the sun, that's 240 terabars, uh, modeling suggests that by focusing, basically, beam intensity 1, 10 to 22, in an array of nanowires, and I explain why nanowires, one could aim to produce basically pressures of greater than 300 uh, gigabars, right? The uh, NIF implosion, right, uh, this is all data. In the, they, they now work at high pressure, right? At the time of the slide was 150 uh, gigabars. Uh, so, so we are studying the interaction of these ultra-high intensity lasers with nanostructures. And the idea is as follows, is that if one interacts with a flat target, right, and uh, have, uh, you know, fairly high intensities, uh, perhaps not the highest, but high intensities, right, one, uh, the, the um, leading edge of the pulse creates a plasma, and then this plasma starts to reflect any light that um, comes after that, right? Basically, the, um, if the f frequency of the laser light, right, is such that is basically um, less than the plasma frequency, right, the plasma becomes a mirror. So one ends up coupling a, only a small fraction of the energy that's coming in, right, into the, into the target. But the idea of the nanowires is that if one comes with a sufficiently short pulse, let's say, for example, 50 femtoseconds or so, the pulse will be able to penetrate deep on the nanowires before they have time to explode and form right, a um, continuous plasma. So one can absorb, in, in principle, like 90%, right, uh, of the light. One can couple, you know, very efficiently if one comes in, right, um, with a sufficiently short pulse. And we ends up, one end, end up creating a plasma then that is very dense, right, and also can be, you know, um, extremely hot. And as an example, here is a target of nickel nanowires, right? And all of you know, know how nickel looks like, looks like the arm on the chair you're sitting at, right? Very shiny material, right? But, but the nanowires are completely black, in fact, incredibly black, right? 
And it's because that's telling you, okay, this material is really absorbent, right? And that holds for high intensity pulses. So these are basically simulations with a code, a code developed by Alexander Pujas, a particle in cell simulation that shows, well, first how the light penetrates into the nanowires, right? It computes the amount of light that is impinging and the amount reflected, the rest absorbed. So you can see the majority is predicted to be absorbed. And this is a map of the electron density in the wires. And you can see how the basically wires uh, get heated and start exploding, right? From the top to the bottom, right? Creating basically a very dense plasma here, like 100 times the critical density, right? Which is also very, very hot. And um, the first experiment we did with this, we did with this nickel nano wires I was showing. And only using really, um, you know, what uh, is a fairly small energy for high, these high intensity bases nowadays. We only use like half a joule, okay, and 55 femtosecond. And with only half a joule, when we took the spectra, we saw that the spectra lines have the signature of helium 9 like nickel. So we have peeled off 26 electrons, right, out of the 28 electrons out of nickel, right? And if we went to it, then we went to just a nickel flat target, and this is the spectra that we got, basically, right? You're producing much more X-rays, right? Um, using this uh, basically nanostructure nano target, right? And in fact, the, the lines there are not even seen. This uh, helium-like uh, lines on a f on a flat target, even if the intensity is multiplied by ten, right? So the amount of X-rays you produce is just, you know, overwhelming compared with the flat target, and the uh, also good thing about this technique is that you create a thick plasma, right? It's difficult to create, right, very hot, dense, thick plasmas. And we want to demonstrate that. So we, b we learned how to build nanowire targets of two different materials. And we chose nickel on top and a cobalt on the bottom, right? Because they are contiguous elements in the periodic table such that their signature lines appear very close to each other, and one can monitor them at the same time, right? And in the, this experiment, we started to increase the amount of nickel on top uh, until we didn't see any more the a characteristic line from um, helium-like uh, cobalt on the bottom, right? So we increase it, increase it, increase it until they die out. And we had to increase, basically, the nickel nanowire length up to, basically, almost six microns. So basically, we are creating plasmas which are extremely hot and dense with basically a depth of like six, um, six microns. And at just a, a basically slightly um, a larger intensities, right, the simulations um, basically predict that once you get basically pressure of the order of seven gigabars and energy densities of one um, um, gigajoules per cubic centimeter, right? This is ultra high energy density, basically that almost the only other way to uh, be produced except with this very high intensity laser is with this megajoule laser, right? There's no other way to produce plasmas with this characteristic. In fact, that plot here, this is a map of plasmas, right? Ma and then plasma is characterized mainly by the temperature, right? The electron temperature and the electron density. And so this is temperature, this is density, so the diagonal is pressure. Right, so above pressure of one megabars, and energy density is above 10 to the fifth joules per cubic centimeter. Wha one has what one calls high energy density regime. Right there, you have we find the um, um, basically um, plasma, I mean the planetary cores, right, um, and so on. Right, and then three orders of magnitude above this log scale, one has this region of ultra high energy density, which are pressure more than one gigabar, um, energy densities, right more than 10 to the 8 joules per uh, um, cubic centimeter. And, well, the National Initial Facility can produce those plasmas, but using these techniques with ultra-fast laser, one can also produce plasmas that are a little less dense, but uh, can I actually even be hotter. And what, what are those plasmas interested in? One is, one is production of X-rays, right? So the um, idea basically is here that, um, you know, the, the one I was kind of mentioning, and also, and if you create a plasma from a flat surface, one creates a very shallow plasma that will rapidly expand, and the expansion will 
cause the plasma to cool, the hydrodynamic expansion, right? But here the plasma is much thicker, right? So it takes a longer time to expand. So when is a situation in which the time that takes the plasma to radiate is shorter than the time that takes plasma to cool, right? And then one can emit an X-ray more efficiently. And the uh, data that we took, right, if shooting a solid target, a slab, right, this is the basically um, X-ray uh, intensity or signal that we, um, co it's a conversion efficiency plot here, right, for a photons of more than one kV. And this is what you get if you use this nanowire targets using the same laser pulse, right? Intensity 410 to 19 watts per square centimeter. So basically there is, right, a more than an order of magnitude increase on the amount of X-rays, photons with energy of more than one kV. In fact, we converted 24% of the laser energy into more than one kV X-rays. And you can do it to do radiography, for example, we had to, uh, we took this, um, you know, actually a, a biological engineer student working with us, he need to, ha he need to, have, a, had to have a bio project to end his project. So he brought this uh, wasp knee and made a single shot image of the wasp knee. For that, we needed to turn the laser down from a few joules to 30 millijoules because 30 millijoules already produce enough x-rays to make that image. And then you can produce higher energy photons, right? And you can do basically images like this. This is an old flip cell phone, right? And these are 71 images, right, of the phone rotated that was made to uh, X-ray tomography, right, with high resolution. This is a project on collaboration with the Los Alamos uh, National Lab. Uh, right now, we are going to make experiments, and we're going to take thousands of images to make really high resolution uh, tomography. X-ray, X-ray tomography. Um, then one can say, okay, was one has this medium, right, that c one can create extremely dense plasma that's extremely hot. Okay, how about try to create some fusion there, right? So we figure out how to make nanowires of materials containing, you know, um, deuterium. So we learn how to grow deuterated polyethylene nanowires. They are not as nice as straight as the metal nanowires, right? Because, as you know, nobody makes skyscrapers, skyscrapers out of polyethylene, right? You use metal structures. But, but nevertheless, still fulfill the need, right? And the idea is that here, th when the wires will explode, they will radially accelerate ions to uh, MEVs, and the deuterons will collide, right? Um, producing, basically, fusion, helium-3, and a neutron. So this can be... A, a a fast quasi-monoenergetic source of 2.4 uh, phi MeV uh, neutrons. And that actually uh, worked very well. We did an experiment um, in which we put several neutron detectors at different distance right from the, you know, from the target uh, and bombarded one of deut these deuterated polyethylene nanowires, right? And we measured the time of arrival, right, of the so what you see in one of these detectors, these are time of flight detectors, is a, a scintillator for the multiplier detector. It will detect not only neutrons, but x-rays. So the x-rays that you produce arrive to the detector first, but after a certain time lag, you see the neutron, right, the neutron peak. That's your second peak. And then measuring the time of arrival for the detector put at different distance, you can determine what's the energy, right, of the neutrons produced. And Basically, we confirmed that these are DD fusion neutrons, and uh, we could produce um, basically 2.5, 10 to 6 neutrons per joule, right? And here you have, we put lead bricks to attenuate the X-ray signal, so here what you see dominantly is the neutron peak. And this is what you get if you irradiate a flat foil of the same material that we use to make the nanowires, right? The neutron signal you get from the nanowire array, right, is um, actually uh, 500 times larger. You produce 500 times more neutrons than from the nanowire array that, um, than if, if you do it with a, you know, with a flat target. Since then, right, we have produced more than uh, 110 to the 7. Um, and then if maybe a final example, right, is to create extreme um, 
conditions, say for atoms, right? To ionize atoms to the highest possible degree of ionization, right? And scienti scientists have done well in this field, right? On creating very highly ionized um, atoms to study, to do spectroscopy, right? Of highly um, ionized atoms and study, you know, the, their physics, right? And for example, physicists invented what is called an electron beam ion trap, right? Would you have an electron beam, right, uh, created, which um, basically creates, um, you know, ions, and there is a magnetic field that basically confines the ions, and the electrons keep ionizing, right, um, the, you know, the ions. So this is a result of um, what's called super EBITs, which is an EBIT on asteroid, and Lawrence Zero National Lab, right? And you have spectrum here in which basically you see basically gold, right, um, you know, um, ionized um, up to um, plus um, um, 69. So gold has 79 electrons, right? So all but 10 electrons were knocked off. Um, here the thing is you're creating these atoms very highly ionized, but on a very tenuous environment, right? Because for the electron beam basically to transverse this and do the job, you cannot afford having a high density. So basically the density um, here is like a 10 to the 12, right, um, basically electrons per, um, a per cubic centimeter, right? With a laser, you can try to do the, the same thing, but produce highly ionized ions in an environment which is 10 times denser, basically at, say, 10% solid density or even solid density. So we did experiment. Before that, um, I, I can show you that people, you know, uh, um, st start doing this with um, the largest lasers, right, on, on, uh, on uh, uh, available, like, for example, the Omega laser at the uh, Rochester, right, was a uh, focus into a solid gold, gold sample, and they created a 57 times uh, ionized gold, right, but now pretty much a solid density, right, 10 orders of magnitude, right, denser than the ion beam, you know, in, in ion trap. They use 9 kilojoules, okay, to, to create a plasma of 6.5 EV and ionized gold 57 times. So we use the nanowire technique. Okay, and this is a model, this is a peak simulation, right, again, with the code from Alexander Puhov. And uh, basically here you see the, the wires exploding, right, and uh, from the tip down, right, and creating this very dense plasma. And there you see the penetration of the electric field, right, um, um, into, the, um, um, into, the, into the wires. And what's predicted is, yeah, in this case you ended up with a plasma um, that had like 15% solid density. Right, when it, this is irradiation of 410 to 21 watts per square centimeter, um, per um, square centimeter, I should say square here. Um, and uh, so th basically, we did that experiment. We created a nanowire of 15% solid density and irradiated. And this is spectrum that came out. We see lines that could, could identify up to nitrogen like gold, basically, which is. 72 times ionized gold, right? At in this in this case, basically at 15 percent, right, in, in solid density, the more than 10 order of magnitude, more than EBIT, and, and in fact a higher degree of ionization, right, which provides you know a, basically an environment in which to do basically atomic physics at very high density of you know extremely ionized uh, matter, right? So um, from very simple simulations, in fact, this is a steady state, um, you know, calculation of what's the temperature that you need to have a nickel-like ion present, and even in a steady state, you need more than 10,000 electron volts, because the pulse of the laser is short. You need even more than this temperature, right? So, but just from this simple calculation, one knows that the temperature of that near solid density plasma, basically is tens, is in the tens of um, um, kilo electron volts. And then if one continues running the simulation, say, okay, laser are becoming more intense. If one uses, for example, 410 to 21, right, um, basically one um, can predict that one will obtain um, gold plus, um, plus 77, basically helium-like uh, helium -like, uh, gold. And 
irradiating, let's say, at intensity of 110 to 22 watts per, you know, um, square um, centimeter. Again, I think there's a typo there. Uh, basically, the prediction is that this wire will explode and will create a very large volume plasma with um, energy density of 80 gigajoules per cubic centimeter pressures of 0.3 terabars. That again, is larger than the pressure on the center of the sun, right? And these are conditions that you have here in Prague, right? Basically, this is doable, you know, right now. So in summary, basically, these high-intensity lasers open, right, a new world, right? There is, you know, it's an exciting time, right, for um, um, laser physics. And many interesting proposals on how to do, what to do with these lasers, right, coming out all the time, right? Uh, we have here sitting in the audience some of the leading theoreticians in the world proposing how to do exciting, you know, like uh, Professor Bulanov, right? How to do exciting things like creating gamma flashes and converting most of the energy of the laser pulse into directed, right, gamma beams with high efficiency and, and many other exciting things, right? Uh, how to do astrophysical experiments on the lab, right? And astrophysics have been a subject right now that one could just observe, right? And it's an exciting field, right? The new probes, you know, are extremely exciting. But now there is also, a, you know, a way to try to basically engineer and create the conditions more than only, a, right, a, 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 a observing. So, of course, many people contribute through the years in to this, um, to this work. A, you know, I mean, it would take a long time to, to mention all of them. I mentioned Carmen Minoni, Mario Marconi, who collaborate closely with Lava Lievsev in modeling. Many of these are students who already graduated and work in different national labs, you know, and industries and, and uh, universities. And just to close, right, I was mentioned, I wanted to mention that the United States took the European example of creating laser networks, right? You have laser lab uh, Europe here that you know has run for 20 years or something close to that that's very successful right that did not exist in the United States basically every institution competed right for grants and sometimes got grants sometimes didn't right but there was not a network and a collaborative environment so there was a report of the National Academy of Sciences on the US uh, four or five four years ago or so or five um, called Opportunities Ultra Intense Laser, and the Department of Energy responded with ultra fast speed. And in about three or four months, uh, they called several of us, uh, you know, in uh, the US who have the most intense lasers, and invited us to create a network that they would fund, such that they would fund each facility, and then we would dedicate time for users, such that scientists from facilities that don't have access to this laser, right, can apply, go through a review process, and gain time at lasers at either universities, right, um, you know, like us, or the University of Texas, or um, U University of um, um, Nevada, um, or, um, excuse me, um, um, University of Nebraska, or Ohio State, or national labs, basically, like, um, Berkeley Labs, Lauren Lieberman Astro Lab, and actually one, there is one, um, um, say, international um, participant, which is um, INRS, right, in, in Canada, that also has a um, multi-hundred terawatt um, laser. So this network of 10 facilities now has been operating for basically three years, right? And it offered been times to US scientists as well as international scientists International P, um, um, you know, scientists can be PIs themselves. They don't need to necessarily have a U.S. collaborator, right? So this is open internationally. Um, and so if you are interested, and um, you, know, you can go to lasernet.org. And of course, you have Eli here, right? That is a user facility. So DOE is working out, or has been is working out. I don't know what status is. A memorandum of understanding with Eli. Right. And in fact, you know, there is a lot to learn from how to operate these lasers as a user's facility, right? So, you know, we are talking about, in fact, we just talked today with people from Eli, right? On trying to share best practices, right? On how to operate these facilities, right? As, you know, as user, um, as user, uh, you know, facilities. So that um, both, um, you know, the facilities here as well as, and, uh, and 
in North America, right, can be operate in you know, the best and most efficient way for, you know, for uh, for users. So, I just uh, will end up with this um, picture of uh, you know the lab where these lasers are located, right, in, in Colorado, and was an afternoon in which the sun, you know, we called this lab Advanced Beam Lab, right, and the sun in this afternoon made us a favor, right, of producing this uh, uh, ray-like, you know, strikes of light, right, on the, uh, you know, on the, on the sky. So I really appreciate, again, the invitation. It's a great honor to be here uh, in this, in, in this uh, very advanced technological lace place and in this beautiful city and also um, to see um, um, many friends. So thank you, thank you so much for the, for the invitation, I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you very much, Jorge, for excellent talk as, uh, as usual. It's amazing to see how the university laboratory is paving the way for the national laboratories uh, <laughs> like uh, Eli Scale and, and so on. You have done so many things <laughs> which now uh, can be transferred to ever bigger uh, laser intensity. So now questions to, uh, to the talk from the audience, please. Okay, Sergey, uh, please wait for the, for the microphone. We are recording. Thank you. Uh, it's difficult to ask a question because of a single question, because you covered so waste uh, area, so many results. And uh, maybe uh, concerning your uh, last uh, slides, when you worked with extremely high energy density regimes, uh, do you see or do you expect to see in your uh, nanowire targets an analog of cell focusing of the light? Because of your set about the intensity 10 to the 21, so units 10 to the 21, but it is in vacuum before the interaction. And uh, how to see such a way to intensify the laser uh, light towards the intensities which are considered for fundamental science? Yes. As, as high as possible. Yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, a very, very good question, right? And let me maybe. Um, you know, uh, repeat it for those of you who are not laser specialists. Okay, if you're a laser specialist, you're properly understood. Okay, but if you're not laser specialist, maybe, you know, let me um, 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 uh, repeat the question, right? The question is that when you go to this, you know, with this extreme intensity, right, light into, into material, right, light can basically, by in interacting with the material, can start to self focusing, right? So you have already these high intensities, and now the light is going to focus to even tighter spots and achieve even higher intensities, right? And the answer is yes. In fact, the simulations, right, show that in, in depending on uh, on the scheme, you will get you get self-focusing. And in one of our latest paper, actually, there is a, a, simu a peak simulation that um, Slava run exactly showing basically um, you know self focusing and the idea was there to grow a sufficiently long nanowire right such that the self focusing end at the plane of the solid target that supports the nanowires right as a way to um, and uh, yeah and it was a significant increase in you know in intensity we have not done an experiment uh, yet try to see that how t um, what would be the you know the um, Best way to do it, right? This is something that, yeah, we need to think and, and, and discuss, right? What, what what is the best way to to demonstrate that you know you're having this, uh, you know, enhancement of intensity due to to self focusing? Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay. Any other question? So, so I really enjoyed your uh, history of X-ray lasers. Well, because uh, when I was young, I was part of that. So, can you comment on the Holy Grail, which is the water window, uh, the status, and maybe prospect? Are we already at the end? Uh, we will not reach the water window to have some really strong X-ray laser down there. Yeah, I mean, and again, let me repeat the question for those that are not specialists, right? Um, Basically, uh, one um, of the motivations to develop, you know, self X-ray lasers from the beginning, right, uh, was to do biological imaging, right, and then there is a region between uh, 
the K edge of uh, oxygen and carbon that goes between what 2.4 and 4 nanometers, more, more or less, right? Where you have high contrast between water and carbon, right? Between protein, let's say, and water. So that's what you need: this contrast, right? Basically. So then you need to develop a laser that works at a wavelength be below 4 nanometers, right? Uh, doing it with the scheme I show, it gets harder and harder, right? Because you need to create more and more highly ionized ions, right? We in our self, in our lab, basically got to 5.8 nanometers, okay? And you say, gee, 5.8 uh, and 4 is not very far, right? Well, the unfortunate uh, thing is that the amount of uh, energy that you need, basically, um, scales, basically, with um, the power that you need to deposit in the plasma. It scales somewhere between lambda to the fourth to the lambda to the fifth of the, you know, the wavelength to the fourth and to the fifth. So it's a large increase. It looks like you're very close, but you're not. It's still a big step, right? So um, to my knowledge, there are not many groups working on that, right? But as you know, the um, Plasma based off the laser community, you know, has been reduced, right, in the last, you know, um, um, several years. Um, Shimon Sokewa at Princeton always had a goal of doing that, but he's kind of still some activity going, uh, basically using, you know, recombination laser, right? And um, basically, of course, these wavelengths are easily generated right now with free electron lasers, right? And there are some, you know, alternative ways to generate radiation at that wavelength. So I think, you know, there is a lot less activity that I'm aware of. Yeah. Thank you. So that's the answer, probably. Just you want to do experiment in water window, then uh, go to LCLS or some uh, free electron uh, laser. Yeah, or, or you know, there, there, there might be easier ways to do it, okay, which is basically, you know, using coherent light, basically, right, which, which these lasers, in fact, a very modest, right, um, you know, um, um, you know, terawatt laser, right, can produce, you know, plenty of radiation, right, at that, uh, you know, that particular wavelength, right? And to do imaging, in fact, you don't need coherence. You don't want coherence because coherence, right, ruins the image, uh, ruins the image, right? So, and of course, there is alternatives like, you know, using high harmonics, you know, and, and so on, you know, so on as well. That doesn't preclude that, yeah, that maybe someone comes with a, you know, a way to simplify things and a plasma-based office relation might happen. But, uh, but there, are, there are no, gr at this moment that I know, there is basically, except for, you know, uh, the group for Shimon okay or at Princeton, uh, there, I, I don't know of any other activity trying to get gain below 4 nanometers. Okay, thank you. So any other Question or just comment? Ah, at the very end. So, Mr. Chervinka will give the mic. Oh, thank you. Uh, my question is concerning uh, nuclear fusion. Can your uh, nanowire targets be applied uh, in, at the facilities like uh, National Ignition Facility to enhance uh, the uh, power or uh, yield of neutrons, or some other way is necessary? to okay. gain practical yeah that, that that's fusion. a very good that's a very good question uh, you know we created this not thinking at all about an energy source okay what we want to know to to create right is in, in, is in certainly a neutron source right um, you know the neutrons that come out from this reaction are you know fairly monoergetic right um, and um, they are very fast, so it's a very short pulse, right? So if one could produce sufficient flag, we can do things like neutron imaging. There are many applications, right, on, on material science, certainly for you know, neutron, neutron type diagnostics, right? And also to study, you know, more, um, you know, create an environment, study more fundamental physics. You know, um, we published, you know, the first paper, this deuterated nanowires and nature communication, like, you know, Four, you know, four, four years ago, right? And it caused some attention, you know, because, you know, s then, like say, senators, right, in, uh, in the U.S. don't go to labs, you know, very often. But it looks like the senator from Colorado, one of his staff members, they maybe because we chose the right title, right? Basically, we chose, you know, microscale fusion, right? Basically, something like that. They Im immediately wasn't, you know, in the media, right? And then one of the staff members of the Colorado senator 
said, oh, look, there's something interesting going on. They probably think in fusion energy, right? So the senator came with uh, his staff, right, to, to visit our lab and spend an hour and a half, right? He and his staff, okay? I said, oh, okay, well, the senator comes, he brings some photographers, then he says, oh, if, you know, senator interest is on basic science with the university. No, he just came with personal interest. He just came with, with he, one person, his staff. After an hour, you know, the staff member said, well, we need to go, senator, we have another appointment. He said, no, 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 he was talking to students, right? And he stayed you know, another half hour talking to, you know, to, uh, to people. Uh, so the answer is we didn't think of that, okay? However, as you are aware, right, there is a very high interest right now on laser-driven fusion, right? And there are a lot of startup companies, not a lot, but there are several startup companies, right, um, created right, to try to achieve, you know, a fusion both by magnetic confinement and with la laser driven, right? Uh, there are actually, you know, two started right in, 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 in Germany, right? And one of them, okay, is pursuing actually basically um, using nanostructures, okay? Basically, um, it's, it's basically generating alpha particles, okay? from, you know, from nanostructures to drive, uh, to, to drive actually an, um, a, yeah, you know, for, for power generation purposes, right? So, you know, um, if you asked me this question, you know, two years ago, I probably said, no, you know, this is a tiny plasma, you, you know, <laughs> and, and so on, it's good for nutrients. But, uh, you know, uh, there are papers being published right now about using basically nanostructures, you know, for, um, schemes using ultra high intensity lasers to try to produce you know fusion for a, you know for energy purposes so i guess the answer is yes right? <laughs> so i think last call for some questions to professor roca well then if not well then uh, the day was long for you right this is the second talk of professor roca he <laughs> gave a keynote at the at the conference <laughs> so then uh, uh, let me conclude the 12th Bozak's uh, lecture and uh, I guess that uh, we can invite everybody for to have the coffee if there is still some coffee and some rest uh, of the refreshment. So thank you very much and thank you for kind attention.